Aloha, and welcome to Don't Just Age, Engage, Think Tech Hawaii's program about aging with creativity and excitement. Program, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, have you come join me today as we explore what it is to have an extraordinary elderhood. Uh, you probably don't know what's available within Honolulu, especially I'm talking about today. At the, the kind of resources that are available and the extensive resources available to really make your elderhood extraordinary. And uh, I'd like to take you quickly to the elderlyaffairs.com website. Michael, this is the elderlyaffairs.com website. Now, you don't see much here, except, except that I can tell you this is an extensive website that will give you, act, put together by the city and county of Honolulu, that will put together, that will bring, to, that brings together all the well available resources that you could possibly need and want to explore. Well, I was looking at the uh, housing one the other day, um, and there was a great video describing the two different kinds of housing available to those of us who are in our elderhood. Tremendous information, orientation, and then access to um, the specific resources that are there and available to us. Now, like I said, I, I bet you don't have a clue of all of that and what all is available. But over the years, there have been those who have invested themselves in making it available to us, making it available to you, and now at your fingertips with the wonderful technology that we have. And uh, I, so I'm welcoming to Think Tech Hawaii's Don't Just Age, Engage, a man who I just recently came in contact with as I affiliated with the Epiphany Episcopal Church. I, uh, I am a Presbyterian minister, but I am and I'm doing my coaching with elders into their elderhood, but I'm recently affiliated with this wonderful congregation, Kaimuki, and uh, one of the members is Lot Lau, and I'd like to introduce you to Lot Lau and ask him to contextualize for us this elderly affairs division of the city and county Honolulu. Lot, welcome, and thank, thank you very much, Larry. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for, for joining me. with us. So, Lot, I'm just really curious. Tell me where you were born and raised, and and uh, what aspects of your early life really kind of got you involved and influenced you in wanting to be connected with elder resources and elder needs. Okay, thanks. Um, I was born and raised on Maui, so I'm a Maui boy from way back pre World War II. And uh, <clears throat> what I, I am the eldest of uh, four children. And I have, uh, 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 for those of you familiar, uh, Lao is a Chinese surname and my mother is Japanese. Uh, on Maui, I didn't grow up with any influence uh, on my Chinese side because my father's family was here in Honolulu and he'd moved to Maui to do teaching. And that's where he spent most of his days uh, as an educator. Uh, so I, was, I grew up in the Japanese culture. And I want to point out, as far as influences, that I learned from my parents both, and my grandparents, my aunties and uncles, because I was the eldest grandchild. Uh, they, they took turns taking care of me. A respect for authority. Respect for authority, obedience toward authority. Uh, I listened and obeyed to authority, and it carried over into what I read in scientific ways or medical ways, and what I heard from my teachers, and especially my principals, because I found a way to visit my principal in those days quite often, and I learned about authority at his or her desk. Uh, <clears throat> I never considered that I would be defiant or disobedient. Um, but I could have been more skeptical. So that's how I answer the question. Good, and, I, good. and I emphasize authority because it has to do with other things that I will say later on. Well, so when did you first become so interested in the, uh, in the general elder population of the islands? Okay, I am uh, 
trained and have a master's in hospital administration. Ah. My early days in hospital administration, I was a planner and I was a manager. <clears throat> I didn't have patient contact and that didn't happen until I changed jobs uh, and I started to work with what you already know a little bit about, the Elderly Affairs Division for the City and County of Honolulu. It is the uh, area agency on aging for the City and County of Honolulu. There are agencies like that throughout our land. And I'm sure that's an aspect that the uh, audience is not familiar with, but we are everywhere or I, uh, uh, in, the, in that sense. Uh, <clears throat> The principal purpose of an area agency on aging is to administer the provisions of the uh, Older Americans Act. It was uh, passed in 1965 in tandem with Medicare, but it's like uh, a, a, a sister or a cousin that is not well known because most of the money is in Medicare, most of the attention is paid to Medicare and its provisions. But well, I, under, I understand, though, that money came from federal, uh, the federal coffers to both state and local entities. Yes, to support the provisions of the Older Americans Act. Uh, <clears throat> let me take a little bit more time with the Older Americans Act. Then. Okay, uh, sure. <clears throat> frail elders. Services are designed to support frail elders, those who are 60 and over. You know, back in the old days, in the mid 60s, people were frailer sooner. <laughs> we've had, we've been blessed by uh, longevity since then that I'm gonna have to say uh, a little bit more about, but the, the act, the law covered those who are 60 and over. And uh, they covered, um, services for persons who are in need of support with activities of daily living, activities uh, of daily living. Uh, and I'm gonna say more about that. Uh, and how I try to remember activities of daily living is with, the, with A, B, C, D, and E, which we all know. I think we all know. And this is how I use it. A stands for ambulation. And that not only means how you walk about, uh, but also how you transfer. Uh -huh. you have a difficulty getting into bed and you need assistance, out of bed and you need assistance, in the toilet and in the bathroom, need assistance. That has to do with ambulation, being ambulatory, and that's the A. B stands for bathing. Now that's... Uh, uh, a term that does refer to a specific service. If elders are in need of bathing per se, people are available to be uh, engaged to help them with that, male and female. Uh, but it also refers to um, personal hygiene for me. Uh, it covers aspects of grooming, uh, uh, cleanliness, your uh, aspects like that. Continence is what C stands for, for me. Yeah. So you actually think about that as a key word, but it does refer to incontinence, does it? Matter? Right. <laughs> you need help with those uh, uh, activities. Uh, D stands for dressing. And dressing can mean uh, being able to dress yourself. If you need assistance with getting into your clothes, if it's evident that you need assistance with choosing what you wear, you, if you're inappropriate, in, inappropriately clothed, then that is a sign that you might need assistance uh, <clears throat> dressing. And the final E stands for eating. So obviously you can picture someone who has to be fed but also it does cover those aspects that have to do with preparation of meals, have to do with the difficulty of cooking. For example, if someone is infirm 
uh, uh, and uh, doesn't for, doesn't remember to turn off the stove, that's a sign. It's not the only thing that might qualify for help with uh, food, like Meals on Wheels, but that's one of the aspects. So ambulation, bathing, continence, dressing, and eating. Yes. Lot. Yeah, one more thing, one more point. These services have costs, but under the Older Americans Act, they're not uh, cost to the client. They're not under the Older Americans Act. Wonderful. They, they could be if you seek help from outside the system, the aging network system, uh, and there are lots of private for free for service agencies in this town organizations that provide that, but at your cost or at your cost plus what you might be able to be to have covered under long term care insurance. Lot that is so helpful. I have I have as a chaplain with a Bristol Hospice Hawaii. I worked with with the uh, team interdisciplinary team that every patient had. And we talked often about the ADLs, the activities of daily living. And uh, I never <laughs> heard uh, such a comprehensive and easily accessible um, description of those activities of daily living. So those first five, uh, the five letters of the alphabet uh, are a great uh, mnemonic tool to remember. And if I may say to those of you who are caregivers for mothers or fathers or uncles and aunts, um, if you notice in anything in these five areas, it's good to take, a, take, take note of that and be considerate about that and uh, to recognize that, the, <clears throat> that your loved one may be moving towards uh, needing assistance and some of the assistance that, as Lot has described, is available on the elderly, um, affairs.com website. So uh, please take, take aware, be aware of that. And uh, it also becomes a criteria for assisted living facilities, uh, whether or not a loved one would, uh, would benefit from an assisted living facility. So that is fantastic a lot. That just really uh, encapsulizes the whole process so well. How has your work history you said you were um, um, you were trained in hospital administration, and if I may give an aside, uh, I spent 25 years in 26 years in Denver, uh, Lakewood, Colorado, <laughs> and and in our discussion with together, Lot and I found that we were in the within reach of each other, <laughs> in reach of the same hospital there um, in Lakewood, Colorado, the uh, the, the uh, Lutheran Medical Lutheran Center. Medical Center. Yes. Uh, let me say one more thing um, sure. before I leave the Older Americans Act. Okay. I want to call attention of the audience to the senior helpline. Uh, it's 768-7700. And if you remember nothing else about what we've been talking about, you can think of that number as the portal, as the doorway to all of the services that the Older Americans Act covers, 768 7 Seven hundred. Easily, rem easily remembered. Um, thank you very much for that. That's the portal, the entry to everything that you need. Um, that's great. That's fantastic. Under the under the older Older Americans Act, nineteen sixty five. Now, is money still coming from that act? Oh yes, uh, it has to be every so often. Uh -huh. uh, I'm long retired from them, but so I don't know the frequency anymore. But it has to be reauthorized by Congress because Congress needs an opportunity to balance the budget needs of the Older Americans Act and its services mm -hmm. against the other needs of the country. And yes, sometimes it's been favored. And yes, sometimes it has not been. Yeah, sure. So, so Lon, how has your work history, which we've touched on here just briefly, influenced your thoughts about elders and their lives? Uh, thank you, Larry, for that question. Uh, the first thing I talk about would be lack of awareness. You see, 
when we go along with our lives, we handle one challenge after another. If we are family people, we are dealing with young children and older children and so forth and so forth. So it's very easy to understand how, look, projecting forward to our older years, we may not prepare ourselves with an, an awareness of what might be available to help us as we age. So I find that lack of awareness among the majority of folks who are reaching the age that the Older Americans Act is talking about. So they make mistakes. So they often, when they uh, are asked about needing help in something or other, one of the activities of daily living, we, we encounter denials. Oh, I don't need that help. They think it might cost money, you see, and they don't know that it is authorized by the federal government. So that's one, lack of awareness. There is insurance. I th I'm sure you know there is long-term care insurance to cover many of the services that, are, that we are talking about. And uh, of course, there's not an awareness of that. I've mentioned denial of mortality. The denial um, occurs in the elder as well as the children of the elder. Absolutely. And I know from my work and observations that uh, arguments occur among family members about what to do about grandma. And this may occur in long-term care. It may occur in hospital corridors or over the bed of grandma. And it may happen between siblings who uh, have been very involved with grandma, think they know what needs to be done, but there's a sibling who lives on the mainland, has not been involved, and has yeah. not been uh, prompted by some awareness of what's available, and they want everything to be done for grandma. I mean, that's yes, a lot. That's so true, and, and you've described you have described situation that occurs so often in hospice care. Um, and we always remind people, remember your mother or your father or your loved one has still hears what you're saying. <laughs> Hearing is the last sense to leave. So it's, um, it, um, so it can put your, your loved one in a terrible predicament as far as her emotional experience or his emotional experience in the dying process of, Siblings are arguing over how to best take care. I'm sorry, that, that just triggered my remembrance a lot. What else did you want to say about this? Uh, well, so it follows, it follows from what we've just been talking about in our experience, that families need to get over denials and need to talk about this pro aging process and what could happen long, preferably long before there's any sign of uh, aging, of infirmity, or of uh, dementia, long before uh, mm -hmm. when everybody's hale and hearty and focused. And I know that's difficult in the pressures of daily living, but that's my, that's my observation, and that's been my advice to people. That's, that is excellent, Lot. And uh, uh, the fact is that um, you and I are, are uh, in the same elderhood stage, although I think you're younger than I am. You sure look way younger than I. And <laughs> we won't go into that. We can settle that on a bit later. <laughs> I'll make so, one more comment uh, about long-term care insurance. This is oh, good. one of those insurances that if you delay and you get older, for sure your premiums are going to be higher, regardless of whether or not you have a pre-existing condition. And that might disqualify you even pre-existing condition, depending upon what it is. But I know for uh, sure, uh. if you wait beyond, let's say, your mid-50s or, or your late 50s, and you try to get into the market then, especially since there are more elders now who are surviving to those ages and needing assistance. And we were talking about limited budgets. There, <clears throat> there will be uh, higher costs for those premiums. Well, if I may uh, comment on that, Percy Ibarra, or Ihara, I'm sorry, Percy Ihara of Generations 
encouraged me to consider long-term care and insurance in my 70s and that it's not too late. So there are adjustments going on, I think, all along as, as more people get into that age group. Um, and so long-term care insurance is not outside of consideration. He said before 79 years old. So, um, so it can be worth it. And the reason that when you think about the reason of thinking about that as a possibility is that we have sources in uh, uh, Medicaid, which handle room and board. Medicare does not do room and board until the last week of life. But, um, <clears throat> and if you don't have access to your own personal um, treasury to support your your aging place you're going to age, uh, <clears throat> and in fact, the place where you eventually will die, then there is Medicaid resource. And then there is this long-term care insurance, which can be purchased at a low rate premium, really, um, and can be a, a great asset. So it's worth looking into, at least as part of the constellation of, of your support system as you, uh, as you go through this elderhood time. So how, um, so how have your um, um, own personal activities influenced how you are aging? Uh, let me start with a bias. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> because Americans live maybe 20 years, maybe a quarter of a century longer than they used to at, in the beginning of the 20th century. And they're living long, not only longer, but healthier because they've benefited from all the information that has come forward. This is my bias. I believe much of those years, many of those years could be used in more community service, giving back. I believe people should try to accept and embrace aging. You know, you and I are smarter than the people who are much younger. You don't brag about it. Yes. Uh, so when you accept and embrace aging, they have a better opportunity to realize their value as elders with a value that we all need with our lives, right? So right. start with the bias and personalize it. I am trying to prepare for my passing while I have time and awareness. My motivation is not to compel any of my children to do what I should or could have done. So I try to anticipate it. I know better than they what needs to be done. So why shouldn't I do it while well, I have the uh, uh, capability? Yes. So 20 years ago, I started talking with them about this. And 20 years ago, there was no sign of infirmity. Oh, yeah. So they were willing to listen to what I said. They weren't in denial for them, themselves or about me. Because when you start to talk to somebody who may be in their late 70s or early 80s about what you, your preferences might be, uh, a person who is already has that in mind because they have seen changes in you, will be in denial. Oh, grandma, don't talk about that. Oh, dad, we've got lots of time to talk about that. And it sure. frustrates the elder who sure. wants to talk about it. So that's what I um, believe and that's what I'm acting upon. I know from my experience that elders are valuable people and I want folks to, to give, to have the opportunity to realize that same thing. Yeah. So, uh, what, what do I do to try to encourage that? Mm -hmm. I keep active. You keep active. I exercise down at the Y. I walk up and down this rise. Uh, you're going to be involved with uh, music uh, sometime soon when we start uh, having ukulele and, and Hawaiian music at the church. I have been doing that in long-term care facilities until we were stopped by the, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, I play golf, I work in the yard. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I do. And I encourage folks to make religion 
uh, and the growth of their spirituality a part of their lives too. I'm, uh, I'm not going to say much more about that, but churches do the same kinds of things because they're uh, tuned into the needs of the elders also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say uh, the spiritual practice, whatever your, your spiritual practice may be, uh, meditation, uh, contemplation, active engagement in society for change and social justice and continuing to pursue that uh, as best you can and as you're inclined to is very important for for inner life um sometimes i have uh, noticed people just get tired um of of trying to make it happen in the external world and so they turn internally at this stage of life part of the spirituality of of uh, aging is a shift from the externals of our adulthood where we have contributed to society we've made families we've made businesses we've achieved and accomplished many great things and then in elderhood we start looking more profoundly than before internally uh, as we move through that final stage of life and uh, it may be questions like what does it mean to me what is how how have i made this past life real how do I integrate the various parts of my past life into a whole seamless theme and story of, of my, my life? I think that's a wonderful experience to be ex- uh, had in elderhood. And it happens, like you've said, in, in a congregation, in a community of people where uh, we're all going through some of the same, same experience. Well, you have made a wonderful impression on me and I'm sure on our, our viewers as well, Lot. Are there any thoughts or principles that guide you now? I'm going to move quickly to summarize some main points. And the first main point about the Older Americans Act is to remember 7687700. And uh, just learn about what they cover. Um, If you believe in the value of long-term care insurance, consider it buying earlier rather than later. And it's good for me to hear, Larry, that the market is opening up along with the opening up of that cohort, age cohort. Um, Last thing I'll say is to give back from the gifts you have given, the long life you have given, give back to society. It's good for your health, by the way. (laughs) Embrace your age. Very true. It's the only life you have. Keep active and engaged with society. Uh, As we define quality of life, going to Las Vegas doesn't count. (laughs) Perfect lot. Perfect lot. Don't just age, engage. And Lot Lau, my friend, you you have embodied that yourself and have addressed that perfectly here today and turned us to ways in which we can certainly do that with the help of the... uh, the beautiful the division of the elderly affairs from city and county of of honolulu thank you so much everybody for joining with us and um tune in in two weeks we'll we'll take a look at some uh uh work that's going on and some opportunities at the waikiki community center with the presence of merle o'neill on my show here and um in the meantime don't just age engage aloha Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.